welcome to Austin Tech Connect, the official podcast of the Austin Technology Council. Presented to you by NetSpend. Homegrown in Austin, NetSpend has been a leading provider of consumer and business payment solutions for almost 25 years. From prepaid cards to mobile bank accounts to money movement services, NetSpend connects people, brands, and payment products to deliver innovative financial solutions. Welcome to Austin Tech Connect the podcast about the future of Austin's technology community. My name is Tom Singer, and I am with the Austin Technology Council. And every single week, we are excited to bring leaders to you on this podcast who will share their stories of success, tell you about their visions for their companies moving forward, and share their advice on how everyone in Austin can thrive as we move into the future. And today, I am excited to be joined by Ronnie Sheth. Ronnie is the CEO of the Sinan Group. Hey, Ronnie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. So if you don't know Ronnie, she is a data girl at heart. She is 100% passionate about data and how that applies to business. She works to help her clients empower innovation and drive sustainable growth by weaving together how to make sense of that data. And she works with small startups all the way up to the Fortune 1000. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about how she got into being so fascinated with data. So, Ronnie, let's go back to the beginning. Give us your background. How did you get so involved in this world of data? So if we go back to the beginning, I'm going to start with my non-traditional roots. And um, for a lot of people who know me, they know that I grew up in India. And in India, what happens is you get really competitive with things. So what ended up happening is I ended up really kind of learning about the world through competition. Um, We did debates, we did um, uh, all kinds of shows. And what I realized is there were snippets of information I took away that I captured in my head. And then I used those, those, those snippets of information and applied those to other realms that were not quite the realm that the data came from. So it really kind of set up in me this curiosity about how the world works and how information works ever since I was little. And as I grew up, that stayed with me. Um, You know, one of the running jokes that I have is, I did my undergrad uh, in computer science and business, and I did my MBA in finance and international business. And those are the only two computer science and finance departments that I haven't worked in. I've worked with everyone else in every other organization, every um, other department and function, just not um, finance and computer science. But what I really want to kind of focus on is those are the two things in my field of study that focused on data. And I've kind of taken really that path to working towards data, to working towards how to leverage data and make sense of that information, whether it's in kindergarten and whether it's in first grade, whether it's in university and post-university, when I started working for companies such as IBM, really kind of bringing that to light in terms of we have all of this data called big data. How do you make sense of big data when you think about different functions, different industries, different organizations, and really kind of bring it together to actually say we're now getting into the realm of leveraging big data to get actionable insights and to improve the business performance of our clients. So I love this idea of going back to your childhood and being able to use data and information in one area and apply it to another, because I think, I think that's really the core of entrepreneurship, right? It's being able to see things that relate that other people aren't doing and take those things to market. And you're one of the first people I've interviewed who really talked about being able to take data in one area to another area. Why do you think that's so important for a successful business rather than, or a successful community rather than being siloed in everything? I think one of the greatest, greatest challenges in the world of data is data silos. Because what happens is you see data, information, raw information, I call data raw information, being kept in these containers. We'll call them containers. And those containers have hidden insights that have yet to be uncovered that could actually bear 
weight upon other functions or other departments or other companies or other your partners or your customers. And what people do is they just leverage the data that they have in their container and they forget that there is this world of data out there that can be used. And a great example of that is, Tom, um, when we think about, for example, marketing. And marketing needs information from their customers, from social media channels, from external parties, third-party vendors. Let's assume that marketing didn't have one piece of information. Let's let's assume that marketing, right now we're hearing a lot about first-party data. Let's assume marketing didn't have insight into first-party data. What would happen? Will they be able to serve their customers in an optimal fashion, in relevant timely fashion when we think about truly brands creating experiences, creating communications, creating those products that really speak to the customer's hearts. No, that cannot be possible. And that's why data silos are really not working for a lot of organizations. So how did you get into to starting your business and, and, and running this company? What, what, what brought you into the world of data as, as your industry? So it's an interesting story. Um, I used to be in the world of data. As I said, at IBM, I used to work a lot with data um, and really kind of focus on data insights uh, in the IBM Watson organization. Um, but then what re- what I realized is everything that I, ha- that I have learned so far, I can actually apply to helping smaller companies because I used to end up, I used to work with some of the larger companies and I ended up working with some of the larger companies. So when I spoke with smaller companies, they had the same challenges. They just didn't have the same help that larger companies did. So I moved into sort of the traditional management consulting role, really kind of ended up working with a lot of SMB clients. And what I realized is as time went by, my clients actually made me organically come back to the world of data because they're like, well, you can speak data, you know data, you can work with data, and you can help us make sense of data. So could you come back um, and help us with our data initiatives? And that's what I started doing. That's really where um, it took off when it comes to data and Senin. And today we have clients, we have Fortune 500s where we work on data initiatives, major data initiatives that are quite public, um, and also small to medium businesses who really need help in making sure that they have the actionable insights to uh, grow their businesses and really to create that impact that they're looking to create in the community and for their customers and for their partners. So that's really how I ended up here. So the, the company is how old? When did you found it? About 10 years ago. So you chose Austin as your home. You you grew up in India. You went to college in the Northeast. What what brought you to Austin? Uh, surprisingly, it was a client that brought me to Austin. It was one of the um, VC portfolio companies that I ended up working with, uh, a very well-known uh, uh, venture capitalist there. And one of their portfolio companies actually needed help. Uh, more so in the customer success function, customer experience function. Um, And again, kind of comes back to data. How do you stop churn? How do you really segment? How do you look at the information? How do you segment the customers the right way? Make sure that you have the right information for the customers to actually be relevant and really solve their issues to stop the churn. So I really ended up working with that company. And then when I moved to Austin, I absolutely fell in love with the city, as so many of us know and can attest to and, you know, can can really uh, connect with. So I actually ended up staying in Austin um, and settling down uh, and expanding my business here. So I'm going to come back and ask you more about Austin in a few minutes, but I want to get back to your sure. company. And that is, of as course. you've grown the company, what have been some of the the, the stumbling blocks, blocks to growing a company the last 10 years? What's What's been the hard parts? I think one of the greatest things I find, um, at least in my personal journey, that's hard is... Um, And I joke about this a lot. You know, I walk into a room and I am barely five feet. Um, I'm young. I come from a very diverse background and I get lost in a crowd. So really to make my voice heard has been a a challenge and it it really has been an uphill battle. Um, But you know, for me, I don't see that as a negative. I actually see that as a positive because for me, what that has done is it has clearly taught me how to look at different avenues 
to make your voice heard? What are some non-traditional ways to make your voice heard? And of course, one of the ways to do that is through a strong community. And I'm sure we're going to come back to this point. <laughs> so that is interesting because I would say anyone who's met you in person, I, I don't think your voice being heard is a hard, a hard thing. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a force of nature in some aspects. I mean, <laughs> You know, you, you, you got, you were very young when you got through college, you started working in corporate America at a young age, you got your MBA at a young age, you mm-hmm. know, so what are some of the things that, you know, being young and, and pushing through as you did, what are some of the things then that were the, the advantage to that? It has to have worked to your advantage in some ways. Um, in a way, I think because of my diverse background, I see things a little differently. I think a little differently. Um, I think my brain itself is wired a little differently, um, just given the fact that we did immigrate. So there's a lot of curiosity, a lot of adaptability, a lot of um, agility. And I think that that works very well in my favor. And especially when you think about moving um, things along um, in organizations that really are in the traditional spaces, you think about you think about retail, you think about energy, you think about CPG. At least na- up, un- up until now, they have been. And you know, when you work with some of these larger organizations, it's it's a bit interesting to see and work with uh, the teams where you really have to find that angle where things truly start making sense, things truly start making a difference. And to me, I find that exciting and I find that it comes a bit easier. So over the last few years, we've heard a lot about about data and all this stuff that you work on, and it's becoming even more and more prevalent in the in the business world. Do you think that this vertical of of data is going to explode in in our business world? Is there is there more business ahead for the for companies like yours? I think we have to be um, cautious when we think about data. Um, And the reason being, you know, a lot of people um, are used to these statements, data is the new oil and data is a strategic asset. What I find is companies very, very quickly want to become data centric. And coming from the data space, I fundamentally fundamentally have a problem with becoming data centric. When I hear the word data centric, by default, data centricity equals we're going to focus on data. We're going to be centered on data. That's not what what, uh, companies should be doing. What companies should be doing is they should be people centric and they should be value centric. So when we think about data, data is a very precious resource. Data is critical in helping us truly understand what's going on and predict and forecast what we can expect in the future. However, building a vertical out of data is something that I don't believe we should be doing because data in itself is sort of the underlying foundation of how you can make better accurate decisions. It's not the decision itself, if that makes sense. No, it makes makes total sense. So if you had a crystal ball and you look to the future Mm -hmm. for all of the tech companies in Austin and all over the world, What should everybody know about data that they just don't know yet in the future? I think that's a great question. And one of the things that I think people should know about data, especially as it applies to the future, is data needs to be understood. It needs to be applied. And it needs to be truly, truly used and leveraged in a cautious manner. Because right now there is such an amazing amount of innovation happening in technology. You take AI, you take quantum computing, you take all of these emerging technologies that will really that have really taken flight and that will really impact humanity as a whole. What I find is that if we don't make sure that we focus on the fuel that feeds these technologies, which is data, we will really lose as humanity. For example, in AI, um, you know, there's this concept called responsible, trustworthy AI or ethical AI, for example. And that is really to do with how do you make sure that AI as technology is human centric and as it should be. So when we think about data, there's so much old data, for example, with bias, there is um, data silos, there's lack of data that allows for real errors 
that affect humans, individuals, and their their privacy, their rights. And I think when we think about data, especially in the future, especially as we innovate, as we grow as humanity, I think data is a critical resource, but it's a resource that needed, needs to be looked at, observed, monitored, and treated very, very carefully as we apply that to technology. Nice. Well, I do want to transition now to Austin because you chose Austin mm -hmm. as your home. You said as many people, you fell in love with Austin and yet you're also yeah. on the road a lot. You travel the world constantly for work. I think we're doing this interview. I think you're in London as we record this. <laughs> yes. So as somebody who lives in Austin, but actually lives out of a suitcase, I think you probably have an interesting view because you come and go from your home city mm -hmm. so often. So let's look at the Austin tech ecosystem. What do you think is going right? And where do you think we need to start focusing as we look to the future? Hmm. So I am very positively biased towards Austin. Um, so let me start with the fun stuff first. For me, Austin is a place to thrive. Um, and there's two reasons for this. Number one, there is a hunger for innovation in Austin. There is a thirst for growth in Austin. Um, and I think Austin truly is well set up to actually fulfill that hunger and thirst. So that's number one, which is really positive as a city, as a community. And number two, I find the Austin community or the people in Austin are fundamentally helpful. So you look, you go to a place uh, like ATC, like Austin Technology Council, and you sit down with Tom Singer or you sit down with one of the board members, they actually give you their time, they listen to you, and they're willing to help. I think that's a very telling thing um, when you think about a city, when you think about a city that is um, bringing in so many newcomers and so much interest um, across the world, not just, you know, across the United States. So when we think about Austin that way, it's the hunger for innovation and it's the, the warmth in the community and the help um, that you find, especially as a newcomer, that's so positive about the city that you I don't usually see in other cities. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that, you know, I, I think we have to be careful to hold on to that. But I think that when you look at the Valley or you look at Los mm -hmm. Angeles or Boston or New York or some of these other places, Austin still has that small town vibe. And for the most part, the people who are here, you know, all have that, you know, welcome to the family because we all remember when we moved here. Right. I mean, there's there's an old joke. Mm -hmm. when, when's the best time for Austin in the last 30 years? It's the week after you moved here. But, you know, <laughs> When you meet people who, you know, the number one question at a networking event for the Austin Technology Council or anywhere else you go is how long have you lived in Austin? Whereas in exactly. other cities, the number one question is where'd you go to high school? So that shows that cultural right. difference that we have to be welcoming because because we all showed up or many of us showed up from somewhere else. Yeah. 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 So what are some of the areas then that Austin needs to be paying attention to when it comes to our future? What is what does the tech community need to do to to ensure that we continue to thrive into the future? I think there's two things, Tom, um, that at least I have observed, and this is a personal opinion. But number one, I think the Austin community really needs to focus on really promoting and really it, I wouldn't even say promoting, but really truly accepting and working with assimilating um, diverse founders. And especially when I think diverse founders, I especially mean women, um, diverse women um, who really need to have a voice in the community, who really need to be part of the community and truly feel like they belong here in Austin, I think is very, very critical. Um, number two, I find when I think about what Austin needs to work on is a lot more collaboration. I think there are so many great groups and great organizations doing so much great work. But think about the power that we would have as a city and as a community if we all work together in tandem, in sync. I think that would really, truly make a dent. Um, and I think, you know, every organization has its vision, has its mission, has its purpose. But I think if we as a city want to grow and want to keep Austin on the path to growth and innovation, I really, truly think that more collaboration is a necessity. It's a fundamental requirement. So I think both of those points are really important. So let's unpack them a little bit one at a, one at a time. 
So mm-hmm. more of an emphasis on on women founders and and diverse founders. This is something I think Austin we we we've struggled with uh, for mm-hmm. for many many reasons. What can we do as a community, and what can the men in the community do to help pave the way so that women founders feel welcome, they have access to capital, uh, they have access to mentors, etc. What what can we do? to make sure that Austin is, is paying attention to women and people of color when it comes to the founding of companies? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And for me, I find that most of the time, I have been very, very fortunate to have very open-minded, very supportive men around me, whether they're young men, whether they're older men, you know, that serve as mentors uh, who have been there, done that. And I think we need more of that. Um, I think what we need is when, for example, you're having coffee with um, a a female founder, really understand her journey and see where you can help her, whether she needs help funding, um, whether she needs help with um, finding a job, whether she needs help with um, really growing her company and establishing herself as a founder here in the Austin community, I think it takes a conversation and I think it takes a heart to help. That's literally all that is needed. Do you want to help? Yes or no. And if you want to help, you will find ways to help the diverse women in the community. Um, And I think that's what's missing. I think it's the conversation piece that's missing. Because if there is more awareness about this issue of, listen, we are here, we need help, who's willing to help us? I think if there is a conversation, if there is truly a focus on making sure that it is recognized that we really have a lot of diverse women in the Austin community who are founding companies, who have founded companies, who are working on their own company and their own initiatives. If we can just look at that across the board and say, how can we pitch in and how can we help? How can we work with these women? If that's a conversation that could be had on a regular basis, I think that that in itself will make a major, major difference. Well, and the Austin Technology Council is actively looking for for new board members. And one of the things I keep telling everybody is I tell them what we're looking for. for to, we're looking for visionary leaders who care about the future of Austin, who want to roll up their mm-hmm. sleeves and be part of a working board as we look to reinvent ATC into the next decade and two decades and beyond. But also, one of the things I ask everybody is we we will invite and welcome with, with a red carpet more founders women, people of color, et cetera, because you can't have success unless you're actually having those people have a seat at the table and a voice to be heard. So uh, ATC welcomes you if you're listening and you want to get involved in the community, reach out to us and and let's see if there's a good match there. Now, Ronnie, I want to go to the other question, the other thing you said, and that was collaboration, because now you're talking my Mm -hmm. language. That is, since I have gotten to ATC, the number one thing I've talked about is how do we collaborate more? Uh, If you go back and listen Mm -hmm. to the podcast two weeks before this one, uh, we had the senior, a couple of the executive board members from Austin Women in Technology on, because one of the things I saw is they do a great job. They have a monthly event. They have a couple of large signature events. There was no reason that ATC needed to be having a women's breakfast and competing with them. So instead, we came together and said, I'll support your events and you support our events. And they have been a great collaboration partner. They haven't looked at it as, well, ATC is competition. It's like, no, you know, you do some events that we would never do. So they support what we're doing and vice versa. And it's really worked out well for both organizations. So if you're a listener of the podcast, go back and check out when uh, Heather and Emily from AWT were on the show two weeks back. So this is something I care a lot about. I want all these groups to come together and I want people to check agendas at the door and really talk about what can we do to thrive for the tech community and the whole community moving forward. What are some things that you think we need to do in the community to push this whole idea of collaboration? I think there's quite a few things we can do um, to push the idea of collaboration. Number one is really align on the vision um, when we think about Austin. And what we want Austin and the community to take away from our efforts as organizations, you know, are we building a siloed initiative or are we actually doing something for the community as a whole? And it kind of goes back to my point about conversations with diverse founders, you know, Tom Singer and, you know, the board members at ATC can have great conversations, but if the startup community that's also, excuse me, in Austin doesn't give the same 
um, amount of um, warmth and acceptance to diverse founders, that's not going to work, work very well because we Austin is, is unique in that way where we have a really great startup community and we have a really great, strong, large enterprise community. What I've found is if we bring those together, the large enterprises and the startups, and if we really start thinking through how can we all work together and all collaborate together to actually make Austin truly be what we want it to be as a city, as a community, and as a place where people can feel at home and actually grow, whether it's diverse women or whether it's simply just founders and CEOs or mentors and peers and colleagues and our children, our daughters and our and our sons, you know, in the future, our future generations, whatever the, whatever the case may be, as long as we all work together and we don't silo ourselves into a category of startups versus large enterprises, I think that in itself um, might make a big difference. And that's just one thing. Nice. And you kind of reminded me of something that I said the other day was that, you know, if a baby is born today and in 30 years, she is starting a technology company, the decisions we make today lay the foundation for her tomorrow to start her thriving company that becomes a thriving enterprise. So what are we doing as a community today that thinks of that baby so that Austin is amazing in 30 years to be that place yeah. to start and grow a company. And it really does go back to that core of collaboration, which is a great transition into the last question I ask everybody who comes on the show. And that is my, my personal buzzword is that community collaboration and conversations can solve all problems. And I say this all the time. If you listen to the show, you're probably tired of it. Imagine in Washington, DC, if all of our senators and congressmen, every time they walked under that rotunda, decided that today I lead with community collaboration and conversations, would we have a better government? And my answer is, I think that's yes. I don't think we have to think about it. So when I say those three words, which one resonates the most with you and why? I think for me, community really is the end all be all. And the reason being community actually to me encompasses this concept and the notion of collaboration and conversation. Because when you're in a community, you are bound to work with each other. The whole concept of community is coming together um, for a common goal, for a common vision, or just simply being together. I think community in itself, to me, is critical when we think about the other two, which is collaboration and conversation. So to me, if I had to choose, I would really put community as the umbrella um, word or, or terminology or notion and actually pu put in collaboration and uh, conversations as supporting pillars to community. So Ronnie, thank you so much for joining us here on Austin Tech Connect. If somebody wanted to find you, how would they get in touch with you? We are found on our website, sunandgroup.com. We are found on the best way to do this is follow us on LinkedIn or reach me directly. We are a very open company. Reach me directly and we'd be happy to have, happy to have a chat with you. Nice. Well, it was great talking to you and I look forward to seeing all the things that you're going to do for this community into the future. I love the fact that, that you're the type of person who, who loves to jump in, have those conversations, but also roll up your sleeves and help make things happen. So we look forward to seeing everything you do to help our community. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and listened to this episode. Hey, is your company a member of the Austin Technology Council? We would welcome your involvement because we want to have you add your voice to our tech community as we look towards the future. So if you're not already a member, join the Austin Technology Council right now. Thanks for listening to the Austin Tech Connect podcast. Make sure your company is a member of the Austin Technology Council and add your voice to the future of our tech ecosystem in Central Texas.